Now, let's take a break here and just kind of look at what an algorithm is. It's a fancy computer science word for a process or a logical process of, of things to do. For example, an algorithm for living, as you can see here, if you're hungry, eat. If you're tired, sleep. If you're broke, then go do some work. Otherwise, watch TV. It's a basic description of how to go about something. But they're useful because they are measurable, repeatable, and we can really examine their results. So, one of the first in algorithms to be developed in the field of learning was the Pimsleur language learning system. If you studied a foreign language, you may be familiar with this already. The famous Pimsleur technique used in popular audio learning tapes was developed by Dr. Paul Pimsleur in the 19 in the early 1900 excuse me, in the mid-1900s. Essentially, they are 20 or 30 minute sessions, or MP3 files, or audio tapes, that introduce and subsequently re repeat bits of information related to the language. For example, you might see a word appear at the beginning of the lesson, and it will appear shortly thereafter, and then each subsequent repetition is, sub is somewhat longer. Now, this technique was definitely an improvement over a lot of conventional techniques for studying, as is evidenced by the fact that it's still a successful commercial product today. But there's some definite drawbacks to the Pimsleur learning system. Most importantly, there's no feedback from the students. It's a one-directional learning system, meaning that you only listen to the audio tape. You have no way to assess your understanding of a bit of information. So that leads us into the super memo algorithm. Pyotr Wozniak, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, is a sort of celebrity within the field of learning and is also very well known for being a recluse. But he wrote a thesis called The Optimization of Learning, and he laid the foundation for what today is known as spaced repetition software. He, this, these algorithms were both exper experimentally and anecdotally shown to be very effective. Basically, how a spaced repetition software works is to choose a fact to present to the student, and then ask the student how well he or she understood it, and then based upon this rating, determine how long it should be before that fact appears again. To hear it described, essentially what's happening here is the algorithm is attempting to reshow a bit of information just before it is about to be forgotten. It's, a, it's attempting to take advantage of figuring out when the positive benefits of activation and short-term memory have expired and prompting you to make sure that you still remember it. And then as you remember it, as, it, as the algorithm becomes convinced that you remember that particular bit of information well, it increases the interval to be longer and longer. Today, several applications use the SuperMemo2 algorithm, including Anki and many other good pieces of learning software. So, what can be improved? A few factors could better be accounted for, perhaps. The primary recency effect might be able to be taken into account when looking at the SuperMemo or similar algorithms. I also, a better understanding of when to introduce in new information as opposed to when to rehearse old it information might also be useful. And also, one of the most fascinating possibilities is the idea of using related information. Could we leverage the power of activation and association? It's a very difficult computer science problem because we would need to, the algorithm itself would need to understand the connections between two facts, understand that two colors are conceptually very similar, whereas a train and a boat are conceptually somewhat similar, and so on and so forth. But if we could leverage this, it might be a very, very useful technique. We, these are just a few ideas of things that might be able to be improved upon. Where are we lacking within this field of improving our learning? Well, getting good data in order to support in, improved learning techniques is somewhat difficult, particularly because a lot of neuroscientists tend to work deep within the brain, and the concept of, as we talked about at the beginning, actually measuring learning is somewhat difficult and subjective. So the, it, the amount of studies using new technology and using um, 
very scientific methods is somewhat lacking, unfortunately. And this is this makes sense too because there's a lot of different ways that each student learns. There's a lot of variables to account for. It's really difficult to set up a very true scientific study within the context of really showing what might and what might not improve learning. So what else might we use if we're else if we're intending to improve upon these algorithms? Some research suggests that the use of colors or senses in our learning can be very, very effective. In fact, there was a study done in the eight, late 80s where a ticking clock was played when students were studying and then played again when they were in a certain stage of sleep. And it was shown to improve retention, actually. More recently, in 2007, a similar study was done using smell where students, when they got an answer correct, were given the smell of a rose, and then that smell was repeated when they were in the specific stage of sleep. And we actually showed a 12.7% boost in retention. So taking advantage of colors, senses, sleep, and things like that might be sort of 20, 22nd century approaches to improving our learning, and might be possible in coming years. But for now, leveraging these things seems a little bit difficult. So what can happen? Students need to adopt new methods because there's the kind of if it's not broken do not fix it sort of mentality at the moment where conventional study techniques do work but without students adopting new methods there's little to no money to actually fund the research to advance them further. And research actually shows that we should be having more fun in order to improve our studies. The more engaged, the more entertained we are by our studies, the higher likelihood that we will retain information. And there's, there's different new techniques being tried throughout the world. For example, there's some schools that are using a very interesting uh, method of presenting lots of information on a quick video or slideshow very quickly, very similar to a lot of the topics we we're discussing here, and then taking a break after just 10 minutes or so where students can go outside and run around or whatever. And they're actually showing a, a very significant boost in grades. And it, this is very interesting because it's kind of flies in the face of conventional wisdom in a certain sense that we should be sit sitting down study for long periods of time. But if we look at the principles presented in these slides, we can see why this technique is effective. We're breaking the study sessions into smaller groups and we are presenting the information quickly and overall the information is being retained better. And if this research progresses, we'll learn more, enjoy it more, and generally be smarter. Hope you found this useful, and if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to leave them here or on my blog at inzania.com. That's I-N-Z-A-N-I-A.com. Thanks for watching.